When I was thirteen years of age a girl with an unusual physical deformity came to live for the summer at her grandmother's house which was on our street. Our neighborhood wasn't very big so there weren't many kids, but what few of us there were built and maintained a fort with a tree house in the woods. Naturally, this new girl wanted to play with us at our fort, so we led her down our trail into the dusky woods. Her unusual deformity was that her index fingers wouldn't straighten all the way out. The rest of us were morbidly fascinated with this weird affliction, and though we tried not to, we couldn't help staring at her fingers. She said she didn't mind if we looked, but I always thought she was hiding the truth that a scocking at her really did hurt her feelings. But since she wanted to fit in, she pretended our offensive preoccupation with her ill-formed fingers didn't matter. Well, not long after the new girl started hanging out with us at our fort, a strange thing started happening. The other kids were younger than me, the youngest being Molly who was nine, nine and a half if you asked her. We were all filled with the vibrant energy of youth so we hated if our parents tried to make us have nap time in the afternoon. That was another reason we spent so much time at our fort in the woods, so we wouldn't have to stop playing for nap time, out of sight, out of mind. Now the strange thing that started happening when the new girl with the afflicted fingers joined us is that we all started climbing up into our treehouse to take naps in the afternoon. We kept our sleeping bags out there, and we always had stuff to snack on like potted meat or spam or sardines or those little cans of Vienna sausages that have the pull-tab ring for easy opening, and of course we had crackers and cookies and Kool-Aid. With the new girl out in the woods with us, we started getting drowsy after we ate our snacks and we all got into the habit of napping. That's when the really bizarre thing started happening. Whenever the rest of us would wake up from our naps, the new girl would invariably be squatting down over one of us with her hands near that one's face. Her index fingers would be perfectly straight as if they weren't deformed at all. With eyes wide with terror, we'd all jump to our feet wide awake and shaking scared. We would yell at the new girl and tell her she couldn't come to our fort anymore but she would always cry and beg until we relented. Then when we let her play with us at our fort in the woods, the same eerie thing would happen again. The new girl's name was Sybil, and she said that a demon lived inside her. She said the demon used supernatural power to put us all asleep then it would whisper in her ear that she should kill us. Sybil's grandmother died that summer. The evening news aired the story that the autopsy found that the old woman died in her bed late at night due to suffocation. Sybil's parents came and took the girl with the afflicted fingers away and we never heard from her again. As time passed, all the other kids in our little rural neighborhood died in tragic accidents. Tyler's brother accidentally blew his brains out with a shotgun he thought wasn't loaded. Molly was run over by a car that didn't see her while she was running in and out of the smoke behind the mosquito spray truck. Karen choked to death when a hard candy got jammed in her windpipe. Dwayne was electrocuted when a CD player that was plugged into a wall outlet fell into the bathtub with him. Our family moved away and as far as I know, I'm the only one of our treehouse club who is still living. Recently there have been reports in the media about a satanic cult in the desert in southern Utah. The leader of the cult is purported to be a woman named Sybil, but I don't know what to believe. I just know that I can't sleep unless the light is on and the door to my room is locked. When I was in college, unfortunately I was part of a group rather gang. That group consisted of six boys and four girls and well I kind of joined that group because of the fourth girl. Basically our group was innocuous except for the people on whom we used to play pranks. There was this guy in our college, not friends with anyone, only a few people knew him. A few people have tried to be friendly with him, but he just liked to stay aloof, once he even told a guy he don't really need friends. Many times he was spotted talking with himself as if for him his own company was better than others. People find him kind of weird and haughty. So a guy from my group decided to teach him a lesson and formed a plan. A few suicide cases had taken place in my college and the most famous one was when a guy locked his gate from the outside, got back in from the window, locked the window, and then hanged himself from the ceiling fan. He did this during summer holidays and his body was found a few days after his death, and people say that by the time his body was found the smell had become so bad that it was spread in the whole hostel. Smell was the reason that his body was found. 
Some people from his wing still say that on some nights they can feel a pungent smell in the air. So what we did was the guy who had made the plan was dressed in sheets and makeup was put on him in such a way that it was looking as if there were rope marks on his neck and his face had become all swollen and his nose was bleeding. An electrical engineer friend of ours pulled the plug which can cause an whole hostile wing to go in darkness. My job was to collect some rotten smelling garbage and put it outside that weird guy's door when the lights were to go off. So when the lights were off and smell had been spread in the whole wing the friend of mine with the makeup knocked on the door of that weird guy. We were all standing nearby. Our friend found that the door was not locked and he went inside and shut the door. We all rushed to the door and pressed our ears on the door. For a moment there was no sound from inside and then we heard our friend's voice dash. You are quite brave. No, not really, came the reply from weird guy. Yes, you are. The last guy I met kept crying like a little girl till I strangled him to death. Well, actually, the thing is that when I was twelve, I was crossing the road without minding the traffic, and a speeding car was headed towards me. My brother, who was fourteen, rushed to me, pushed me out of the way, and collided with the car. He died instantly, but he is still with me, and I am sure he will protect me from anyone who will try to harm me. After a moment's silence, we heard a shivering voice of our friend Dash. Is he here with us? Oh yeah, he is standing right next to you. We heard a shout and someone running towards the door. We were all terrified and were unable to move. That person who was running collided with the door and fell down. He got up again and opened the door. It was our friend still shouting and we all ran like hell. Listen. I beg you to help me. Please, I don't want to die. She'll kill me. Save me, please. It's Michael here. It's 1.34 a.m. right now as I start to record what I just observed. Please, I beg you all to listen with patience. What you're about to know is as important to your life as it is to mine. I'm here sitting on my desk, revising for my exam. Just as I was sipping the coffee I heard the voice of water droplets falling from a tap from the washroom. At first the drops had very little frequency and I didn't care but the frequency increased rather quickly and the noise too. I went on to check the tap and see the amount of water spill, but I was extremely surprised to find not a single clue of water drop. The floor was as dry as it can get, and also, the voice stopped as soon as I entered the washroom. Taking it to be some malfunction of the tap, I came back to my room. It was my biggest mistake. I continued my studies but once again, the voice came back. This time, it was much fiercer. I again went to check, and what I saw made me scream like anything. The tap was on. But this time, too, it wasn't water that was coming out. It was blood. I ran out of the washroom and entered my room. I locked it and took out my phone. Tried to call my parents. Tried to call my friends. But to no avail. The connection was there. But phone wasn't working. Suddenly, my eyes fell onto my cup of coffee. It freaked me out like anything. I'm sure seeing something of that sort will scare the hell out of you too. Except for coffee, there was blood. Further, the blood was leaking out through the cup, falling on a paper lying below. It fell and as soon as it got absorbed on the paper, some word turned up. I tried to read it, it said. I am death. I saw a shadow. Something I can't describe in words looking at me from the window. I ran from there and now I have locked myself in the storeroom. This is a small room and I find it safe. But it isn't that safe I fear. God save me. I beg you to come and help me. Save my life please. I'm here, in the corner, recording this so that you know I am here. Save me. Please save me. I can hear something approaching. I fear something is right behind me. We are separated by just a wall. Save me. I don't want to die. Please save me. I don't want to die. It's coming. It's coming closer. Oh no, I can hear the door bolt opening itself. Save me. I fear it will kill me any time. This was a two years back but thinking about it still gives me the goosebumps. It was 10 a.m. clock and I was on my computer studying. It was two hours since I was working on a boring chemistry assignment. So I decided to take a break. 
I started watching some videos. Now my table was a bit far from the window. But the window was on my left so I could hear anything clearly if someone was outside. As I was watching a video I thought I heard a footstep from outside. I decided to ignore it as I thought it was my imagination or maybe it was the sound of the video. I decided to close the video and get back to work. Just as I started doing my chemistry assignment, I heard another footstep from outside. I ignored this one too. But after a few minutes I heard a small and clear laugh and another food step. This time it was loud near and clear. It came from outside I was sure I went to the window and looked outside. There was no one and it was empty. I decided to tell my father it was freaking me out. I went to my father's study and told him. He of course did not believe me. He said I was being paranoid and misinterpreting sounds with the computer but I was sure it wasn't my computer or my phone. I told my father to go and investigate. With great reluctance he agreed. With a torch he went outside. After some time he came back and told our neighbor was doing a work in his garage and it might be the sounds I was hearing. I did not believe him and it did not explain the laugh I heard. But I decided to call it a day. I went back and finished my chemistry work on the computer it was now 12.00 o'clock. And I decided to go to sleep. Surprisingly I never heard anything. I was beginning to think it might be my imagination. So I went to sleep after brushing my teeth. I am usually a heavy sleeper but that night I had trouble falling asleep. But I managed to finally fall asleep. I was woke up to a sound I heard. I realized the sound was the laugh. I heard another footstep from outside. My parents were sleeping. So was my brother so I decided to investigate. My phone told me the time was 3 a.m. clock. Everything was so dark. My bed was near to the window than my table. I took my phone out and switched the light. Everything was okay until I shone it near to the window. What I saw gave me goosebumps to this day. Standing outside with her face pressed against the window was a woman her face was covered in blood. She had two bloodshot eyes and had a mouth with sharp teeth. She was laughing silently. I screamed. The woman disappeared. My parents came over and asked what was it. I told them they did not believe me they told me it was my imagination but I was sure I saw her. My father checked outside found nothing. They finally managed to convince me to sleep. The next morning as my cousin and my brother was playing outside they discovered a white cloth and a photograph of a woman in front of my window. When they showed it to me I got scared it was the same woman whom I saw. But I never saw her again. I was 18. It was 1996. Gap year between high school and college. I was living in Florence, Italy studying Italian. My high school buddies were backpacking through Europe. I wasn't allowed to do that. My parents said they'd pay for the trip but I had to do something productive. I pouted at the unfairness of their decision. My God the arrogance of an 18-year-old. I was a terrible student. Missed class, partied, never did my assignments, etc. Result, never learned to speak or write proper Italian. One weekend I was invited by my backpacking buddies to Milan because my they were going to see the Milan Inter soccer game. I met them in Milan on a Friday and would then stay a few days exploring the city, but I had to be back in Florence on Sunday because I had school. I arrived at Santa Maria Novella, Florence's main train station, Sunday night around 11 p.m. It was pretty empty. I went to the restroom and a man, maybe 40-ish, followed me. There were ten stalls maybe. He picked one right next to me. Strange, uncomfortable, weird. Yes. I believe most guys would agree we like our space. But then he started staring. Yes. At my penis. I didn't finish peeing. Got a terrible vibe. I zipped up and left. My thought was maybe I'm exaggerating but rather be safe than sorry. I was a student. Nothing flashy. Not much to steal. But I got scared and paranoid. SMN has bunch of columns by the terminals. I felt crazy doing it, but I started to zigzag to see if the guy was really following me. I headed towards one exit then did a 180 and headed towards the other. I was young and naive, 
and told myself if this guy is still behind me then this is really serious. I looked back, and yes, he was indeed following, no doubt about it. I could have called for help or pressed the panic button, but as I said I was young and dumb. I left the station, and the street was pretty empty. 11 p.m. on a Sunday. He was right behind me. About halfway down to the block there was a coffee shop still open but about to close. The lady at the shop told me I could order something but I'd have to be quick since they'd soon close. I ordered a Coke and took my sweet time drinking it. The shopkeeper was annoyed but allowed me to stay while she did her cleanup. The guy that was following sat on the curb right across the shop and stared at me. I figured I was safe as long as I was inside. Why didn't I tell the lady what was going on? Why didn't I call the cops? I don't know. I was dumb. Had no real idea what was really at stake. I finished my coke. It was warm by the time I finished it. And the shopkeeper who had been patient enough said she was finished cleaning and would be closing and I had to leave. I was terrified but I paid and looked outside. The guy was gone. I paid and ran to the nearest bus stop. The bus was there within minutes. Of course I could have done things in a smarter, safer way. Call the police, tell the shopkeeper, call the taxi, etc. But I didn't. To this day I can only imagine what this man was after. Something sexual. Human trafficking? Mudding me? My younger cousins have done their gap year abroad and I get scared for them. The world is a beautiful place. Definitely worth exploring. But unfortunately it's also a place we share with people who are willing to do terrible things most of us would never even consider. I know one but it's not in my hometown. It's just five kilometers apart. There is a road connecting the major city and our town. In middle there a small village. So in the outskirts of that village there is a specific place where so many accidents happened. I know it's quite common for accidents to happen at a particular place may be because of cracking in the roads or turnings. But this is not the case with this place. When I was small kid an accident happened at that place and only bride and bridegroom died on the spot and one else and later one car the whole family died and the list goes on and even before many accidents happened there. The villagers said that the place is haunted because of so many accidents taking place and so many died there and the souls will be wandering there. But I never believed in any of that until it happened to my family members. So on that day me and my brother we went to school as usual. My father, mother and my elder sister they went to city for shopping and for some groceries on bike. While returning to my town at the exact place they met with an accident, and thank God nothing happened to them but some minor injuries. When we went to home there were people in my house and we rushed inside to see and a doctor came and cleaning their wounds. So at night I asked my father exactly what happened. He said, They returned from the city and when they entered the village at outskirts they saw at a distance a group of cows grazing on the field to their right and they were so far and he was driving. Suddenly a cow from the left jumped on the bike and it just disappeared into air. My mother and my sister they fell into roadside bushes and my father neck got struck in the handle and he can tee even breath. Then he saw some group of people standing there looking at him. But his vision is blurred so he can't see them clearly and when he was asking for help they were not even helping and simply standing there and watching my father. The villagers who were there at that time in the fields came running and saved my family. But my father never believed in ghosts or spirits and even after that accident he said, Maybe I was hallucinating, but I know he was little frightened and I can sense some fear in his voice when talking about it, maybe because he doesn't want me to get frightened. Even after that so many accidents took place and still going on but the thing is deaths happen there is not because of some other vehicle. Every time people saw some visions which cause accidents and they just disappeared after accident and mainly deaths happening and happened there was really horrible dot if people survived they had some minor injuries but people who died there, never taken to hospital died on the spot, body parts getting separate from body. I work for Casca Entertainment Company, a production company specializing in the creation of short horror videos and films for YouTube. As part of my responsibilities, 
I frequently visit abandoned locations such as old houses, deserted places, and graveyards to capture eerie and atmospheric scenes for our productions. This unique and immersive approach allows us to deliver captivating and spine-chilling content to our audience, providing them with a thrilling experience through the exploration of unsettling environments. During the second phase of the pandemic, the death toll was very high. Graveyards filled up, and people began burying bodies in abandoned places, then fleeing. Even now, who knows which abandoned places might have buried bodies beneath them. One day, the boss said he wanted to take pictures of me near Bachelor's Grove. I was scared and didn't agree initially, but he managed to convince me. Believe it or not, as soon as we entered the place, shivers ran down my spine. Everything was okay, and suddenly, there were some strange noises as if someone fell from the top. He, however, clicked my pictures. Up to this point, everything seemed fine. Then he suggested I change my dress, and that's when it all started. To change, I had to go to the first floor. I took him along with me as I was scared. He came along. I started changing my dress, and suddenly, a loud thudding noise came from somewhere. We ignored it, and he clicked. Suddenly, there was a loud scream, and we looked around, but we didn't see anything. I got scared. Then we heard a gunshot from somewhere, but we didn't see anything. Someone slapped my boss really hard, and we both ran downstairs and out of the building. But this was just the beginning. We started our car and drove away. Suddenly, a pebble came from nowhere and damaged the car windshield. However, we managed to escape. We reached our homes. Around 1 a.m. in the middle of the night, I woke up in severe pain as if someone was trying to twist my stomach. I felt cramps, as if I was about to have my period. It was terrible pain around the lower abdomen, or right at the uterus. Then the pain subsided slowly. The next morning, I woke up to find my bed flooded with blood. Just a few days before, I had my period and it all started again. I had my period for twelve days from that incident. I bled heavily those twelve days, changing tampons every four hours, which I had never done before. I went to the gynecologist on the fifth day. He conducted some tests, but he was also shocked to see that nothing was wrong, everything was normal. My mother saw this and gave me a cross to wear, instructing me not to remove it unless I was cured. However, I continued with my office, and my boss, now very caring, said he wouldn't joke around with me unless I was cured. On the thirteenth day, suddenly there was a cracking noise, and the cross broke from my wrist. I was very surprised that I did not have my period on that day, and everything went back to normal. However, I became very weak internally. My mother gave me a lot of fruit juices to drink and took special care of me and I was fully fit and fine in a couple of days. We, along with the boss and his wife, went to the priest of St. Mary's Church. He said that horror films are inspired by real-life incidents and portrayed with some spices for entertainment. However, spirits exist in real life. The only difference is they cannot be seen, but they can be felt. He continued that if he had not given me that sacred cross, I would have bled to death and the cause of my death would have remained a mystery for everyone. He continued that many people die mysteriously because they don't know the real cause, and science gives vague reasons to cover it up. He advised me to stay away such places, 